All right, good morning and uh, welcome to the TBI Topics webinar, Health Disparities and Traumatic Brain Injury. We appreciate everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, so this is a joint project of the Harborview Injury Prevention and Research Center and the Washington State Department of Health. And we're also in partnership with the TBI National Peer Learning Team. So definitely appreciate everyone who's joining us from all these, uh, all these groups. Um, this is the last uh, webinar in our current series of this current TBI Topics webinar series. So we appreciate you joining us for this important topic. We could go to the next slide. Great, so uh, before we get started on the presentation, so I wanted to briefly remind everyone that we do have a discussion board, a place where we can continue the conversation after today's webinar. Um, and the discussion board is called TBI Topics for Health Professionals, and we post the webinar recordings there, discussion questions, resource sharing, Ask the Expert events, uh, and those Q&A sessions. Um, so this is a great way to continue to share resources or share your thoughts and ideas um, following the webinar. And the goal is for this to be kind of a place for people to interact and, and build relationships, uh, people who are working in TBI across the country. Let's go to our next slide. So um, today, uh, immediately following the webinar, we invite you to come participate in a, in a discussion with other attendees from the webinar. We've got two discussion questions uh, that are posted, and of course you can post other questions and your own thoughts and responses. So the two questions we'd like to uh, consider today are, in what ways is your organization working to promote health equity, whether that's in TBI or in other um, fields? And then how are communities impacted by health disparities in TBI currently part of addressing those disparities and how could they be? So how, how could some of these communities uh, be a part or be included or be a foundational piece in addressing health disparities and building health, health equity? And our URL there at the bottom is tbi-topics.boards.net. And you'll also get an email near the end of this webinar that has the direct links and all the instructions you need to participate. So hope we'll see you there. All right, and let's continue on. And we're going to get started with our first presentation today uh, by Dr. Megan Moore, um, who is a TBI and health equity researcher and the Sydney Miller Dowd Associate Professor at the University of Washington School of Social Work. She's also a core member here at Harborview Injury Prevention and Research Center. So thank you very much for your time, Dr. Moore. Thank you. Um, I, I am really glad to be here to discuss uh, traumatic brain injury disparities and strategies and recommendations for addressing disparities. It's an overview of what I will try to cover today. I'll provide a brief background about traumatic brain injury or TBI as I'll be using that term interchangeably throughout the talk. And, and then I'll talk about an overview of traumatic brain injury disparities and some examples, specific examples from our work. And then I will discuss recommendations for research and practice within the context of a program that we have here at the Harborview Injury Prevention and Research Center called IHEAL, which stands for Injury Related Health Equity Across the Lifespan. A TBI, or traumatic brain injury, is caused by a bump, blow, or jolt to the head or a penetrating injury that disrupts the normal functioning of the brain. The severity of a TBI can range from mild to severe, and most traumatic brain injuries that occur each year in the United States are considered to be mild traumatic brain injuries. The causes of traumatic brain injury um, include falls, uh, sports-related traumatic brain injury, pedestrian um, accidents or, or injuries from being hit by a car, uh, motor vehicle accidents, assaults, uh, military-related traumatic brain injury, bicycle accidents, and being struck by, by an object. And I also have a picture here on this slide of some folks at the top drinking alcohol uh, because alcohol is a risk factor for uh, getting a traumatic brain injury and also a risk factor for, for poor outcome after TBI. In terms of epidemiology and costs, it's estimated that approximately 3.5 million people each year sustain a TBI in the United States. 2.87 million present to an emergency department or are hospitalized or die. Uh, as a result of a TBI. One third of all injury related deaths are caused by TBI. And about 384,000 um, confirmed traumatic brain injuries by the Department of Defense um, have been confirmed since 2000. Uh, it's estimated that TBI costs an estimated 77 billion in indirect and direct medical costs each year. 
falls where the, this is uh, data from, some of, this, some of these data are from 2014, which is the most recent, and then some are from back in 2006, um, because some of the um, data related to race um, and traumatic brain injury uh, is, has not been updated since then. Um, falls were the leading cause of injury in uh, TBI-related emergency department visits, hospitalizations, and deaths. Over half were in the youngest group, that's age zero to four years, and in the oldest group, that's uh, older than 75 years or older. Older adults have the highest rate of hospitalization and death in the United States, and males have higher rates of TBI. Compared to white persons, African-American persons have higher rates of TBI-related ED visits, hospitalizations in most age groups, and then highest rates of, um, higher rates of death for those um, under 44 years of age. In terms of outcomes, um, cognitive deficits, patients report recall information processing speed, attention and executive functioning difficulties, impaired physical functioning, mental health symptoms and behavioral problems result, can result after TBI, and patients report headache, fatigue, sleep disturbance, and irritability. In terms of outcome disparities, uninsured individuals have poorer outcomes. There are racial and ethnic disparities in mental health and functional outcomes, and rural urban disparities in outcomes for children, as well as in rates of TBI uh, for children in uh, rural areas. Compared to non-Hispanic white children, Hispanic children experience disparities in long-term disability. And that's, uh, that uh, data comes from uh, work that's been done here at the Injury Center from our colleague, Natalia Jimenez. So I thought I would um, provide that overview and then give you a few specific examples from our work. Um, we focused here on trying to understand um, TBI service access and utilization as, as a potential driver for some of those outcome disparities that I just mentioned. One study that we conducted, um, we, in that study we looked at the availability of outpatient rehabilitation, rehabilitation services for children after TBI and we were really interested in the differences in service availability by language need and insurance status. So we developed a comprehensive statewide database of pediatric providers, services, and geographic locations in Washington State, our state here. And what we found um, was, was very uh, disturbing in terms of availability of access to services. So what you see here in this table is that bottom, where the arrow is pointing at the bottom, Row, that's the total pediatric rehabilitation services. And that first column is the number of uh, services provided to children and they, who, the children overall, so all services accepting children. Then as you move to that second column, that you see the, the drastic drop in availability for services that accept children and also accept Medicaid insurance. And then the third column, you see another drastic drop to 26%. And that is services that accept children who require language services, so language interpretation, either the child or their family required language um, services. And then that last column, um, the most disadvantaged group, children who have Medicaid insurance and also who require language services. And I want to point out here, uh, the most egregious uh, lack of availability is in mental health services. So you see for children um, with Medicaid, and who require language services, um, only 8% of the total uh, services available in the state were, they were eligible to, they were even, the, their insurance would even be accepted or their, um, would be able to provide services in their language. So what we drew from this is really there's a need for standardization of care transitions to improve these linkages, certainly, but also we really need to think about policies to train and incentivize providers to serve children with Medicaid and who, who need interpretation services. Because as you see from this, this is availability of services, so we can do great transitions and have great plans from the inpatient side, um, but when, when they're going out to the community and their insurance isn't accepted or the services don't provide what they need, that's, a, that's more of a systems issue that we really need to um, focus on from a policy level. So we also, you know, looking at that and sort of understanding the um, service, the lack of services available for mental health um, for children after traumatic brain injury, we decided to look at racial disparities in outpatient mental health service utilization amongst children hospitalized for TBI. So not what services were available, but what were they actually using? And in this study, we used market scan Medicaid longitudinal billing data. Um, that's uh, 
data set um, that many of you would be familiar with that has good longitudinal integrity. It's complete payment information, um, including payments from both the benefit plan and the patient. It has a privately insured um, data set and then a Medicaid uh, data set, and that's the one that we use with the Medicaid. We included um, persons uh, less than 20 years of age who were hospitalized with a TBI from 2010 to 2014. And these were children who were Medicaid enrolled prior to their, uh, one month prior to their TBI and then continuously enrolled for 12 months after so that we could track their utilization for that 12 months. Um, we looked at the mental health service use at TB, time of TBI hospitalization, three months and 12 months post-injury. And a total of, uh, I hope you can see that, yeah, a total of 5,674 uh, 5, children were included in the study. And what you see here is the proportion of children receiving mental health services really exhibited an upward trend in service over time across all the racial groups. However, utilization was persistently lower for children um, who identified as non-Hispanic Black, Hispanic, and children in the other racial group compared to the non-Hispanic white group, which is the top line. Also of interest here, there were no differences, significant differences by race, ethnicity, and mental health service utilization during the hospitalization. Where we see the disparities is at the three month and the four to 12 month uh, time frames. And here, what we, what we showed is that among children who received, so this is the children who received mental health services, the average number of visits, again, increased over time for all the groups. But the disparity across race and racial and ethnic groups persisted with um, children in the non-Hispanic white group receiving more visits in the time periods um, post-discharge, respectively, compared to the children from other racial groups. So our recommendations here, what we, what we thought about when we looked at these data were that Yes, there are racial disparities in utilization of post-injury mental health services, and hospitals do have the ability to identify and provide mental health services to children in need, so there were no differences at the time of hospitalization. So thinking about, really, again, these evidence-based standardization of care transitions and improving linkages in the community, as well as policy-level changes that increase access for children who may face barriers on the outpatient side. Um, to receiving services and rehabilitation services as many of you know are critical for children particularly hospitalized children hospitalized for a tbi in terms of their recovery so accessing services is linked to their outcomes which is a potential for why we see those outcome disparities so it's really a could could be a really important focus of intervention the other thing that we have done in our work is we've talked with many uh, parents of children with traumatic brain injury about their experience in the acute care setting, about their experience discharging home, about their experience uh, returning their child to school, um, and just getting back to their life. Uh, and we've talked over the years, we've talked to dozens and dozens of families and parents and caregivers. And we're really working, using all of that information to develop a family-centered care care model um, after pediatric traumatic brain injury. And I'll tell you just some of the main findings and conclusions from that work. Caregivers, in general, um, did not understand TBI, what, what that means, what it means for their child. They didn't understand the care instructions, the Medicaid management, and the implications for their child's TBI upon discharge. Parents did not feel prepared for discharge and felt, I don't to describe, feeling very surprised by some of the behaviors, symptoms, and just the level of care that their child would continue to need post-discharge. We also spoke with um, caregivers um, with limited English proficiency, and what we, what we noticed in those conversations and in comparing those to our um, patients who spoke English um, as their first language, um, the caregivers with limited English proficiency experienced less frequent, lower quality, and sometimes incorrect information. In terms of returning to school, we've talked uh, again, talk to many different parents and children as well, um, and it is difficult for children and their parents um, to return to school. We've also spoken with school providers um, in different studies that we've done, and there are many different um, potential intervention points to help children with TBI return successfully to school with potentially with some accommodation, and so we're, work we're currently working with schools, school providers and um, families to develop some models for that return to school. Caregivers, um, over the course of this work, caregivers have provided strategies um, to us that we've developed into a family care, family-centered care model. And the sort of three core areas where they, that they've talked about that, we've, that we feel like are uh, really good potential intervention uh, points 
in the acute care side are communication, capacity building, and care coordination. So we've developed over time this, what looks like a pretty busy model, um, but at the top what you see here is the patient and pro provider and family characteristics that they, they come in with, uh, as well as situational characteristics. They have, a, they have an injury. And then in the middle there, you see the intervention domains that I just, that I just talked about. Communication strategies, coordination strategies, and capacity building strategies for providers, parents, and for the facility. And that's happening at the, at the acute care level and in the transition from acute care to outpatient care. And we think that impacting in those three areas can impact health literacy and development and also ultimately the health outcome of the child. And so what we're doing right now is we've, we're develop, using this uh, model and this sort of theory of change to develop intervention models that we are um, planning to test in an acute care pathway that we have here at Harborview for children with severe traumatic brain injury. So I'll talk now a little bit about some recommendations and some uh, plans, that, the things that we're working on here um, to address some of these disparities through our Injury-Related Health Equity Across the Lifespan program, or IHEAL program. The IHEAL program has sort of three core components, research, community engagement, and education and training. And all of these things aim to achieve large-scale large scale and sustained impact um, towards health equity and injury. In terms of our research, we're really um, focusing our effort, efforts on leveraging and expanding our existing collaborations via grant writing and collaborative research. We've co completed a scoping review of injury disparities, not just traumatic brain injury, but all, but all injury disparities. And using that, we've, um, we've developed um, some, some plans and some strategies for moving forward. We are working on a grant currently, an NIH-funded grant to improve the health equity data collection in our national trauma data system, which is a key, will be a key um, component to improving our, our understanding of disparities. As I mentioned, um, some of the, the data related to race and ethnicity and other health equity variables is limited in our national data collection system, so we're working to improve that. Um, as far as community engagement, we've developed a community advisory board here at the center, and we are beginning to work um, on utilizing the community advisory board to help guide and move our work uh, forward. In terms of our education and training, we've embedded the health equity content across the curriculum and training programs here at the center. And we really, I wanted to end with sort of two slides that really hopefully can ground, ground our conversation and discussion in terms of understanding community uh, conceptual model for community-based solutions to promote health equity. So this is from National Academy of Sciences. Many of you have likely seen this. It's a few years old now. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a model of um, a, a sort of strategic model for community-based solutions aimed at health equity. It's not injury specific. But what you can see here is that community-driven solutions are sort of encircling the whole process. And then they have the focus on the social determinants of health in the middle. And it's really reminding all of us that the health, health systems and services, which is that sort of in the top right there, um, that is one part of the whole picture of this more, more social, social ecological model and understanding health equity and how we actually impact patients' lives. Um, you know, we, in our work here at the Injury Center, um, in my work, I do focus on the health systems and services in particular as a, as a place to deliver some of the interventions, but I think we need to be thinking about how do we address employment, education, transportation, housing, all these other things, maybe partially at, at the level of the healthcare system, you know, when they're in the inpatient, but really as you've seen from some of the work I showed and what you all know from the work you do, really focusing on the outpatient side and helping the patients, that's where they're spending most of their time in their rehabilitation, so really focusing on some of these other things that can be barriers to accessing the needed care that they that they need to recover successfully. And I'll just briefly, that's, we've um, expanded that National Academies model and applied it directly to um, injury, the field of injury. So what you see here is the top half of the wheel describes the factors that contribute to inequities in injury incidents, treatment, and outcomes. So discrimination is the overarching process, as you see at the top there, by which an individual's privileges, communities, and opportunities can result in inequitable injury um, risk and also care. And then the bottom half of the wheel describes specific solutions to ameliorating injury-related health equities across the lifespan. So, so as you can see, solutions that are community-driven cut across the research practice and policy to result, to result in the most impactful um, resolutions. What I also want to point out in this model 
is that the solutions um, really are at multi-level here. So we're looking at both at macro level solutions, meso level solutions, and micro level solutions. And so I really think that I, I wanted to end with this, with this model to really help us think about where your work may fit into either the micro, meso, or macro um, layer of this, and that all of those layers are important if we're really, as a, as a community, if we're really focused on um, achieving health equity and injury. And I want to acknowledge all the collaborators and the funding sources. And we are then going to move on to our next speaker, and I will briefly introduce um, Ms. Maria Cole. Uh, she is a case manager at um, the Baylor Scott and White Institute for Rehabilitation in Dallas, Texas. She's going to talk with us about navigating health disparities in the Bright Project. She'll tell us more about the Bright Project, but I can say briefly the Bright Project is a, um, is a PCORI, uh, Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute funded project um, to improve um, collaboration and um, transitions of care for patients with traumatic brain injury. The principal investigators are Jesse Fan and Jeannie Hoffman, both here at the University of Washington. Rhea, I will let you take the mic. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moore. That was an uh, awesome introduction. Uh, just to clarify, do you guys want me to run the slides from here? Is that, is that correct? Yes. Yes, Maria. Thank you. Yes, that was great. Great. Can you see my slides? Yes. Awesome. All right. So as uh, Dr. Moore mentioned, I will be speaking about the uh, BRIGHT project, which is the Brain Injury Rehabilitation Improving the Transition Experience uh, study. I am the research case manager over at Baylor Scott and White Institute for Rehabilitation, which is in Dallas, Texas. Uh, this is part of a uh, PCORI funded grant. And what I will be discussing with you today is uh, the study itself and talking about what the behavioral components of this uh, case management intervention are, uh, specifically what the roles of uh, TBI care managers do. And from here on, we'll call them uh, TCMs, myself included. I'm at the TCM at the Baylor site. And also to talk about those engagement strategies uh, for those individuals who are experiencing some of those disparities in care uh, that we already, already had that great inter introduction about. Uh, so uh, the BRIGHT study, uh, the lead PIs on this study are over at the University of Washington. As uh, Dr. Moore mentioned, they are uh, Dr. Jesse Fan and Dr. Uh, Jeannie Hoffman. And they knew a couple of things going into this study. The things that we knew were that uh, the current practices for TBI care post-hospital discharge are largely inconsistent, and also that those treatment guidelines are not currently based on any uh, comparative effectiveness research, but they more just emphasize uh, education and advice, provide referrals, uh, and then uh, just some general information about how to treat chronic symptoms. Um, some other things that we know that are uh, positive and leading are that uh, the telehealth models for case management can really help to overcome barriers to treatment for individuals, uh, patients, and families and improve their quality of life after uh, TBI. So this study then uh, took that information and wanted to look at what the standardized discharge care plan is as as is right now and look at it compared to an optimized transition care plan and specifically we're looking at uh, participation and health related quality of life 
uh, and uh, just a note as we go into this, and I'm talking about uh, the Bright study here, this is a very large pragmatic trial with six healthcare systems across the country serving as study sites. So I, I simply can't do the project justice in 30 minutes, uh, but I will uh, try to explain the uh, primary components and uh, we can discuss at the end any specific questions that you have. Uh, as you know, I'm sure individuals with TBI often experience some of these chronic symptoms and functional impairment uh, that can be potentially disabling. So looking at uh, the BRIGHT study, this comparative effectiveness trial, uh, we are looking for what the participants and families are saying. Are there improvements or not uh, once they're in outpatient care? Uh, so we do measure the trajectory of improvement uh, across the first year post-discharge at three, six, nine, and 12 months post-discharge. Uh, we do also look at uh, differences in healthcare utilization between that standardized discharge care arm of the study and the optimized transition care uh, arm of the study. Uh, we also look at caregiver burden. And since our study began, we have roughly uh, 300 patients across all sites and about 150 caregivers uh, across all of the sites. The TCM start working with them about one week post-discharge. Uh, so this is what the standard contact schedule looks like in the, uh, the intervention arm. Uh, so in the first month post-discharge, the contacts are about weekly, and then in the next couple of months, they uh, decrease to bi-weekly contact, and then the last two months, they go to monthly contact. So ideally, the intervention will be 12 calls over six months to either the participant, uh, who is the patient who sustained the traumatic brain injury, or the caregiver, if for any reason that patient is Perhaps they left the acute rehab setting, but perhaps they're in a uh, subacute or um, perhaps they're just not up to talking on the phone yet, or perhaps they have um, uh, still some communication barriers, then these calls can be with either the participant, uh, or excuse me, either the patient or the caregiver, or both can be on the call. Uh, the contact structure, so for each call, it's very important primarily to develop rapport with the uh, family that will be on the call, uh, to also on that first call and then for the first uh, several calls looking at the discharge plan. Uh, there's a specific needs assessment that is employed on each call. There's also uh, a list of needs then from that that are uh, developed and then prioritized and that's a conversation really between the the TCM and the patient and caregiver as you kind of rank what's most important uh, then of course it's starting to address some of those needs so that can involve uh, providing or facilitating access to resources information about community things that are available maybe getting them back into the hospital system depending on what those needs are and also reviewing at the end of each call what the follow-up plan is. So then what uh, will be discussed on the, on the next call. And then the TCM would organize any tasks that needed to be complete. So if there was a referral that needed to happen or anything like that. So the needs assessments were created uh, with engagement from the stakeholders in the study, and the stakeholders in the study are all persons who have uh, either experienced a TBI personally, or uh, they are the caregiver of someone who experienced the TBI. So this was a very uh, thoughtful community-based intervention in which uh, the stakeholder engagement here was really important to help guide these conversations and questions were asked in a, in a way that invited a conversation about, you know, what, what was your experience when 
you went through this? What do you wish someone perhaps would have asked or um, what were you really struggling with at that time? So on each call, the TCMs will ask about uh, these areas and then if there are any issues that they're having, then we go over to prioritizing those needs. So first thing first, especially in the beginning calls, we look at the items on the discharge plan. So if there were follow-up uh, doctor's appointments or if there were folks who maybe they needed to reach out to within the first couple of weeks home, uh, then we start there. Uh, definitely keeping in mind what is uh, the patient's most important thing. Uh, it's not always the first thing on the discharge plan. So talking through some of that with them, uh, starting with some of those goals that are going to be able to be attained so that the patient and family can feel like that progress is continuing uh, in their rehabilitation journey. And then we start looking at uh, just the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, what needs to happen first? what is really feeding into their self-esteem, and then what's the ideal, where can they keep going from there? Uh, so more specifically about the, then the TCM role, as I mentioned, it really starts with the engagement piece. Uh, for anyone who's provided uh, direct patient care, as you know, the what's really important is having uh, patients and families who are engaged because they're more likely to talk uh, about their needs. It'll be easier to get them to try different things or to kind of think outside of the box. And as from a research perspective, more likely that they'll stay in the study. Uh, so it's very important to try to capitalize on that time right when they're home, uh, start talking to them and getting them uh, engaged in the study so that they can really see those benefits of treatment as the study continues. Obviously, when someone first comes home from the hospital, there are oftentimes uh, barriers to engagement. Uh, so most practically, sometimes there's a time component. For instance, if the patient has been in the hospital for several weeks, they get home and now that caregiver has to go back to work and there's not really a plan, like what will the patient do all day, every day while the caregiver is at work. Um, sometimes there was an elapse in insurance if the patient was, for instance, the uh, breadwinner in the family and now they can't work, or uh, perhaps transportation if there are children in the home. So there, there's oftentimes a, an, an issue to work through. Uh, from a psychological perspective, sometimes it's just a big sigh at the end of the acute rehabilitation stay. Uh, there has been this culture for several weeks, perhaps several months, of patient family being in the hospital, the constant alarms, the constant uh, you know, probing and questions and uh, th that hospital stay experience. And when they get home, sometimes they just don't want to be on the phone with someone else from the hospital. Uh, so that can be something to work through as well. There's also sometimes, oftentimes, a mental health uh, component. If the experience can be very challenging for a patient or a caregiver or both, uh, just to adjust to that new normal, what is life after disability? Uh, there can sometimes be negative experiences. If there were other um, things that had happened before, sometimes some distrust of the healthcare system in general, there are definitely cultural and race differences in uh, how people experience and process someone calling the house after the injury and what kind of questions may be asked, what things they may feel like are more private, uh, and how to address that. And dealing with uh, just self-efficacy, a lot of times folks really want to uh, get back right away, and rehab is a journey, and just kind of dealing with what are the appropriate ways to progress through that. 
And then um, a big barrier that I've seen at my site specifically is uh, experiencing folks who have a low health literacy. And a lot of times what that can look like is there are several different uh, ex systems that a patient or a family may have to interface with in the outpatient world and not really understanding those outpatient instruct instructions from each different place. Uh, the case management is kind of that person that TCM is that person who can help kind of synthesize that information, but it can still be really difficult at the onset until those patterns are, are established. Uh, so some of the strategies then that a TCM might use to interface with a patient and uh, their family. The ORS is a pretty popular one, uh, which is just asking those open-ended questions, uh, affirming the patient, uh, reflecting, so uh, ensuring to express empathy and being sure that it is authentic, and then just kind of summarizing and uh, feeding back into the conversation and just making sure it's not uh, something that is a, a power structure, but very much a, a conversation and just kind of figuring out how can the TCM best help the patient and family to progress in the rehab journey. Motivational interviewing, we'll talk about a bit more on the next slide as well. Uh, those types of situations are usually used uh, specifically when there are more barriers. Um, problem solving is another one. And uh, sometimes there are difficult situations in which there may be conflict resolution that is necessary. So an example of that may be the TCM is in uh, talking to a patient and the patient's primary goal is to really get back to work. Um, they don't really want to talk about the other things on the agenda. They just really want to get back to work. And the caregiver's primary goal is to really increase the patient's ability to do things at home. So maybe getting back to doing laundry or fixing their own meals or um, something of that sort. And so there's a conflict between what the goals are of the patient and what the goals are of the caregiver and the TCM um, kind of has to navigate in between those two and figure out where there's a, a happy medium or perhaps where there's more priority and uh, helping the patient and family through that situation. And then uh, coping, of course, which we already mentioned, uh, there may be physical changes. Uh, lots of times there are cognitive changes after TBI as well, and just dealing with what that new normal is. Uh, so motivational interviewing is most often used when uh, there is a specific barrier with the, the patient. And some examples could be perhaps they're not answering the phone or perhaps there have been a couple of uh, calls in which the TCM said, okay, let's get this done by next call. And then next call, it's still not done. And said, oh, okay, no problem. Well, let's get it done by the next call. And then it's still not done. Um, and kind of trying to figure out what is the best way to increase uh, the likelihood that the patient will follow through and will have those uh, resources that they need. And perhaps it is something that is more, um, they don't quite understand why it's important and starting there could, could definitely help as well. Uh, sometimes there are patients who just say, everything's fine. And perhaps everything is fine, but oftentimes when uh, patients say, yeah, everything is fine, it's um, there are other things that could be worked on. So getting a caregiver involved or another healthcare professional who's working with the patient and family may be an appropriate move there. Uh, sometimes patient families are just resistant or guarded, um, defensive, definitely sometimes um, hostile, maybe because they're just tired, they've been through a, a big ordeal. Uh, so motivational interviewing may be used at that point. Uh, sometimes there's just a, a shutdown from the patient or family side, and they just think that the problems there, this is just life, and perhaps that's not the case. 
or maybe there's just not a confidence uh, established yet with the TCM and they just don't feel that the TCM can be effective in making change for them. Uh, so another strategy that could be used in some of those more difficult situations are uh, the ABCs of problem solving, which is uh, assessing, brainstorming, uh, then choosing a solution, developing a plan, uh, evaluating, which is a, a big important piece of it. Did it work? If it didn't work, then you start the ABCs over again. And then uh, you flex the plan as needed if perhaps a couple of things worked the way that they were supposed to, but something was still missing. Uh, so then you would continue to make little tweaks to the plan until the uh, patient and family were able to see the success that they were looking for. Uh, other engagement strategies that may be used uh, are different things that would address the cognitive changes or sometimes uh, behavioral changes or communication changes that occur after TBI. Uh, all of the strategies are evidence-based strategies that are uh, already known in the post-TBI uh, research world about best ways to help with adjustment to disability. Um, so these things can definitely help to make just some of those everyday issues in reestablishing a routine uh, a little bit easier. So things like if the patient becomes uh, really emotional when a new thing is introduced then having separate conversations perhaps with the caregiver just about how to remain uh, calm during those situations and not to feed into it uh, can, can help change the dynamic at home and the communication process at home and can help to advance some of those perhaps bigger goals in the treatment plan. So far, what we have learned in the study are that uh, the higher needs patients often require more than those 12 calls. So patients who are low income, who have low health literacy and oftentimes low education really need more uh, touches to work through uh, some of those barriers into getting established outpatient providers uh, post-injury. Oftentimes, Medicaid-eligible patients as well need more assistance, even once they have their Medicare, or excuse me, their Medicaid case manager, they oftentimes still need frequent touches. Uh, coincidentally, that kind of goes hand in hand with uh, the prescribed number of calls may need modification. There are patients who leave the hospital and a couple of calls in, they have a really strong support system, they have uh, established outpatient providers, they don't really need a lot, uh, and some patients really do. Uh, and then I've talked about a bit, just kind of navigating those barriers uh, in between the patient and caregiver and what their different needs may be. Uh, some other things that we have learned so far are that there are emergency needs that come up. And again, those would need more frequent touches. Uh, thinking about some of those issues that we've talked about, and we can go more into this as we have our discussion, but if a patient was a primary breadwinner and they're injured and they can't work, and perhaps at some point they lose the insurance, uh, that can create um, some housing issues, uh, if they become financially unstable, if they're food insecure, and those require a different level of intervention than just the uh, even weekly calls, if it's towards the beginning. Uh, we've also learned that having a patient advocate at an appointment can be really helpful for uh, patients who are low health literacy or low health or low education 
to understand and receive some of that information, even on demand. So just simple things such as um, having the patient do like a, a talk back and asking them, okay, well, um, you know, well, what did the uh, physician say? Or what did you understand from that? I can be really helpful to helping them to maintain a new medicine or something like that. Um, having more health literate handouts. So in the outpatient offices, having uh, things that have pictures or fewer pieces of text or larger uh, text uh, can also be very helpful. There are several components of psychoeducation that specifically on my site with my patient load, I have done a lot of just talking to patients and families about adjusting to life after disability. So how to overcome some of those communication challenges, but then also just really becoming okay with what that new normal is and changing the perspective from not looking at it as necessarily limitations, but just new things that will be embedded in life uh, going forward. Uh, also, if outpatient offices have social workers in their offices that TCMs can connect with, that can really help to not only decipher information, but sometimes cut down on healthcare utilization. If there's someone that they can just call and ask a question to versus having to come back into the office or uh, make another appointment for or uh, go to the emergency department or something like that. Uh, also having a nurse educator can help cut down on some of those unnecessary visits. Uh, so some of the challenges that I have experienced and that we've also experienced across all of the sites are if a patient doesn't have a primary care provider to go back to in the community, sometimes that means they came in and didn't have a primary care provider. Sometimes that means that they lost uh, insurance in the process and then there's no longer a primary care provider. Uh, definitely loss of insurance can be an issue in trying to navigate some of those healthcare systems. In Texas, uh, we don't have, uh, we have one of the lowest uh, Medicaid insurance rates. So not a lot of people have state insurance. Uh, it was a non-Medicaid expansion state. So it, it definitely is more restrictive in, as far as state funded resources go. Uh, so that can present challenges. Uh, if a caregiver passes away, if a caregiver uh, decides to no longer be involved, uh, there was a, a situation I had uh, where a patient got divorced shortly after the injury and that definitely presented some issues. If a patient has very low social support, uh, that can, all of those things can really cause issues when it's time to hand off, if there's no one to hand off to, obviously, but if there are certain indicators that this patient may not fare very well, then it, it can be very problematic at the end of six months, then there's kind of what next. Uh, so some things that we know are that those long-term supports will be necessary for those who have not made significant progress during the intervention. Uh, sometimes we have made adjustments and kept folks on the caseload for longer than six months, just so that we could find a person to hand them off to. Uh, we definitely try to be proactive as well so that we can work through the intervention to make sure that person is identified for the end of the intervention. Uh, but there, there are obviously those challenges. Uh, we have also experienced some successes. So uh, we've developed these engagement strategies. Lots of them are evidence-based. Lots of them that we have also learned uh, during this trial, and it, because it's a pragmatic trial, having that ability to make little tweaks when we know that a patient, for instance, who is very low income will need certain things, uh, that has been very helpful uh, to build trust and develop rapport with uh, patients and caregivers. Across all the sites, we have made over a thousand calls uh, to patients, caregivers, and uh, their healthcare providers during the first 
uh, six months of the intervention. Uh, also, we do know and have some feedback from our patient caregivers, uh, from their assessments, and from just anecdotally from the TCMs as well. Uh, we do know that this intervention is averting some of the barriers associated with uh, transportation uh, specifically and helping to build uh, those community, that bridge for those community resources uh, between the patient and caregiver uh, once they're back in the community. So I believe at this time we are transitioning to uh, questions that you may have and I believe you're typing the questions and I just uh, uh, want to also give a thanks to the TCM team. There are several across all of the sites. I believe there's eight of us now uh, and definitely our lead PIs. Great. Thank you very much, um, Maria, for your presentation. And we are going to go into our joint Q&A session. So um, if you're a user uh, watching the webinar uh, on your Zoom meeting, either at the very top or very bottom of your screen, you should see some tools. And one of those is Q&A. And that will open up a box where you can type some questions um, for our speakers. So you can direct it to one or both. And our hope here is to have a, a conversation um, and to, uh, to further our discussion here with our speakers. Um, so I'm going to start us off with the first question, which is to both of you, which is what do you think we need to learn next? Like what's the next areas where we need to build our knowledge to better understand and address uh, health disparities in TBI? Well, I think in terms of uh, building building knowledge, I think we have identified many disparities, both in traumatic brain injury and you know, across the injury spectrum. Um, I think where the field um, is moving and is um, number one, um, collecting better data um, and better longitudinal data for our patients to, to track them long term so we know what's happening to patients um, in different with different identities and in different groups uh, over time and we're, we're working on that. I think the other thing like we were talking about and as Maria you know talked about in her, her presentation you know really focusing on the community and community-based solutions and social support networks um, that patients are already embedded in and working with community um, in order to address some of the disparities that we that we know are there, I think um, you know that that really is intervent you know intervention work and intervention work that's driven by by the communities affected um, by by injury and in this case traumatic brain injury. I think that's the um, the way the field the way the field is moving, and I think that's a good thing. Great. And Dr. Moore, when you're responding, I'm getting a note that you're a little bit hard to hear. So if you could um, uh, be closer to the mic or a little bit louder, um, I think that would help everyone hear your responses. I can. Great. Thank you. Miss um, Cole, anything to add on what you think we need to learn next in order to, to help better address health disparities, maybe related to the BRIGHT project? Um, I, I think everything that Dr. Moore mentioned uh, is, is very valid. I think that there are some uh, regional differences in how post-TBI care is uh, deployed. And so I think that it would be fantastic if we had more um, advocates, more researchers, more uh, policymakers who were really looking at ways to augment care in their wheelhouse, so to speak, so in their region or in their uh, state. And I think that that would help, but there is a also a lot of uh, general information that I think is a great place to start. Great. And um, we have some questions here in the Q&A tool. So first is, is there a best practice model that has been implemented at hospitals for reducing disparities that we can learn from? I mean, I think that's a great question. Can you hear me better? Yes. Okay. Um, that's a great question. I think that um, there are evidence-based practices and practices certainly that are being used in hospitals. 
case management models and transitions of care models. Um, I think that um, I think there's still work work to be done and improvements um, that we. I mean, these family-centered care models um, that you know have been written about, and you know the family-centered care model that we've developed here, um, based on our interviews with parents of. Uh, children um, who have severe traumatic brain injury that, you know, we're kind of taking some of what's been done in other illnesses or other, other disease states and applying it to injury. And I think that's promising. Um, so I think, yes. Yeah, so I think there are uh, models available. I think that like kind of, kind of, kind of building on what Maria just said, I think how they get, how those models get implemented and the level at which they um, are actually practiced um, and standardized, I think does vary. And I think that's where we see some of the, potentially some of the disparities, um, you know, playing out as well. So really trying to focus in, I think, on patients that we know um, are at risk for facing um, some of the barriers that Maria talked about, um, you know, kind of on the ground when they discharge. I think that's, that's where we need, where we need to focus. And, and I think that's, what a lot of us and, and many of you likely um, in your practices are doing across across the country. So another question we have is, um, why is this topic not more of a conversation in TBI given all the attention to health disparities overall? Yeah, that's, you know, I've wondered that myself. I, you know, I think it's beginning um, at least kind of circles that I've you know, kind of been exposed to more recently. I think it, there is a, a bit of a shift towards more conversations about it. And certainly um, in our scoping review that we did of injury disparities literature, which is currently under review. So we'd be happy to send that out to this group and post it um, when it's, once it's out and published. But what, you know, what we found is that the research on injury disparities has increased over time. Um, and it's actually the number of articles on research or on injury disparities is the given our criteria of what we were looking at had doubled since 2000 between 2007 and 2017, which so I mean I think there is an increasing kind of um, acknowledgement of of this happening in injury and that we, you know it's a, it needs to be a focus, um, and I'm you know I think it's exciting that that we're doing this webinar and all of you join so I think there's movement and momentum I think um, I do think though it is it is a field that hasn't talked about it for as long as maybe some other fields, um, other disease, you know, kind of disease states or, or uh, medical issues. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure the reason. I, you know, I'm kind of, I'm a newly, uh, been at University of Washington for seven years, so I'm also coming in. And I come from the social work perspective, which that was my training and my background, and also as a, as a social work provider in uh, medical settings in San Francisco at San Francisco General Hospital. So I come from that background and that, so that's always been my focus. I worked, when I worked in San Francisco, I worked with patients with traumatic brain injury and in their program there. And, and that really inspired me to sort of start thinking about a lot of what Maria has, was talking about, about really the significant barriers faced by many patients who are coming in um, already, you know, struggling, potentially struggling with, with mental health symptoms, you know, socioeconomic uh, problems. So, and then there, and then they have this injury that really begins a cascade of potentially really negative, you know, events in their life that that can be very, very devastating for both them and their family without the resources um, to support them. So that's kind of what my background and how I came to this. So it's something I've thought about, um, but I, you know, again, I'd be interested in, in others as well. Um, I don't know if we have that ability to interact, but others that have been doing this longer, I'd be also curious about your perspective. You know, I would love to add to that, Dr. Moore, as well. I think um, I was recently at uh, the ACL, which uh, is the Administrator for uh, Community Living. Uh, they did a, a joint congressional brain injury task force meeting. So there was a TBI awareness day on the Hill. So we were over in D.C. and brought together lots of federal uh, research institutions, lots of stakeholders, so lots of patients, uh, caregivers, families. Uh, researchers who were there just talking about, uh, you know, things to do next in the field and kind of where we were and where versus where we want to be. And one of the things that was brought up a couple of times, which as a social worker was very clear to me when I walked in, it was representation. 
Um, there is not a lot of representation in the field currently, for instance, for uh, people who have severe TBIs. They are not speaking for themselves oftentimes. Someone has to uh, be their advocate, be their voice if they cannot do it themselves. But if you think about the circumstance for someone who has been impacted by a severe uh, TBI, that caregiver may be at bedside 24-7. So how are their voices being lended to this research? Well, if, if I think the onus is on us, if as researchers we are not getting in the community, if we are not making it um, available online, if we're not making it very accessible for them to also share their opinion um, and their thoughts and their experiences, I think that's how we get to a point where folks aren't really considered in some of this. It, the same types of things with folks who are very low income. Uh, there's lots of research across, just across the spectrum, it, disability and um, other things that are studied folks who are living in poverty are very unlikely to participate in research studies. They have other priorities. Um, and so how are we making this accessible? And what are, we, what are we doing and what tools are we implementing to make it uh, easy and also um, being very thoughtful in that process? Thanks, Maria. Really great point. Yeah, and, and that, I think that's a great point, and it leads a, a little bit maybe indirectly into our next question that we have, um, which is a question on, are there websites or resources um, that either of you recommend that have evidence-based post-engagement strategies to engage individuals with TBI? Maria, do you wanna talk a bit, bit about that? Sure, so I use um, a lot of times it's just the uh, the Knowledge Translation Center and I, I use a lot of that because they're to work with the patients because their um, information is oftentimes very health literate, great pictures, not a lot of text on many of those things. Um, outside of that, I think that it's important to maybe do some of the classes maybe could be online. Um, there are different certificates that you can have to become a brain injury specialist and things like that. And I think being able to do some of those things online if they're not um, currently offered, don't wanna step on anyone's toes, um, I think that would be great as well. But I, I really don't think that it's a, a one and done type thing. We talked about that a lot at the Awareness Day as well. Um, I really think that the training is ongoing um, because there's that saying in TBI, if you've seen one TBI, you've seen one TBI. And I think being able to engage with individuals, being able to be empathetic and thoughtful about um, how you are working with families, I, I don't think that you can do that necessarily one time. Um, so I do think that there are, there are some resources online, but I do think that it also has to be just ongoing. And I don't know that that resource yet exists uh, virtually, but perhaps someone will do that. <laughs> Another area for development. Yes. Um, great. Well, we have another question here with, um, although the discussion here focuses on TBI treatment and the disparities that are occurring after an injury, do any of your injury prevention specialists experience disparities in prevention education around TBI and MTBI? Yes, there are, I mean, there are, yes, there are disparities in, um, you know, risk for TBI and that's likely linked to some of the prevention um, campaigns and, and prevention strategies that we have, have been using. So some of the work that's been done here at the Injury Center um, around booster seats and safe and active transports is a good example where, you know, there's a campaign to increase the use of booster seats for kids four to six years old. And that was a, that was a base, you know, based on research that um, without the booster seat, kids in accidents are in, in car, in car crashes are at high risk um, for severe injury. And so that's what, um, you know, that was one, um, Big campaign that was done here and what we realized some of the researchers realized in doing that is that it wasn't reaching some of the communities um, that were being affected and that of you know the clinical on the clinical side some of the patients that the kids that they were seeing on the clinical side 
So what they did is they actually worked closely with communities um, in, in our um, American Indian, Alaska Native communities here to work with with their um, health, you know, sort of public health group and try to tailor the uh, booster seat um, campaign in order to reach th those families as well. And so that was, that's just one example of a prevention campaign that, that was tailored and sort of more community based. Um, and, and so I think, I do think we, as, as a community of public health providers, that's something that we need to think about. And kind of like Maria was saying earlier with um, you know, sort of just in general thinking about disparities, it really is our responsibility. You know, we, we have this information and so helping, working with communities in genuine, um, you know, relational, collaborative ways from the beginning. Um, so that's like, in our case, we're, we've developed a community advisory board that we're beginning to engage with to sort of say, what is, what's important to your community? What do you see happening? Here's what we see. Here's what we've seen at the hospital, or here's what we've seen in some of our data. Does this ring true for you? What is important to your community, and how can we help translate some of our community or some of our public health messaging around prevention to your community? What makes sense for you? And um, we've been working also with the university here to literally translate some of our messaging into Spanish um, to get that out to our Spanish-speaking communities. We had a recent. Um, a recent campaign on, on booster seats that we were successful in, or um, not booster seats, uh, yeah, car seats and, and booster seats that was recent that we did this year. And, and so I think there's, there's ways that we need to be, as researchers and public health professionals, we need to be actively and proactively thinking about this, and it needs to be organic. Like, we need to build those relationships over time so there's trust between uh, you know, our community stakeholders, the research community, and our provider community. And that takes time, you know, and it takes it takes commitment to, to the process on all sides. So it's not easy, but I think that's, at least from my perspective and you know, from looking at these models that have been developed over time, that's really the way that, that this is gonna be, we're gonna have some impact um, here, so. Right, and I think that makes a lot of sense, and particularly as you mentioned in your presentation about that there are many causes, different causes for TBI, and I think each of those also interacts with different, commu different communities, have higher or lower risk for those different causes. That's another kind of factor that goes into that prevention piece. Mm -hmm. um, great, so we have another question here, um, and has some context with it. So we have, uh, what support ideas do you recommend for youth TBI survivors that are transitioning to young adults? In many ways are functional with great progress, but seem to fall in a gap where their challenges of recovering from a hidden injury cause them to experience a gap in support, both in the medical and social community. Are there TCMs available by telehealth, specifically in Washington State, for young adults who are not Medicaid eligible? I, um love this question and thank you to whoever asked it because I think that this is the most important part of what we do. If you, even as a, a researcher period, if you publish, publish, publish and you can't get the information to people, it's really um, not doing what it needs to do. So um, and keeping in mind that this research intervention currently is a research intervention and so um, TCMs are not broadly available. Um, to my understanding, Dr. Moore can speak more specifically about Washington State um, and what may be available there. Um, what I wanted to offer to this question is that I, I think that this issue is very real and I think it's very often uh, associated with a TBI when you it, recovering from that hidden injury and all that that encompasses. Um, if there are not local things that you have found in your area, what uh, some of my patient families have been very successful with are um, virtual communities. It, I've mentioned a couple of the challenges in Texas, and one of them can be that folks are very spread out. And so many families have come together online. There are a couple of different um, Facebook groups. I know there's also um, a website and I will look for it here and if I, I can email it over to uh, Kelsey if I find that info as well. But it, being able to connect virtually for some folks has just helped them to kind of have that community. 
um, of other people who are experiencing the same types of things. And as far as um, looking at different types of, of support, it is oftentimes a really, really hard find. I know that the Brain Injury Association in Washington, uh, specifically, they do um, many kind of public campaigns and different um, activities and try to incorporate a lot. So if you haven't tried that, that may be a good place to start as well. Um, Dr. Moore, do you have more to offer specifically for Washington State? Yeah, I think that's right, Maria. That's where I would start is the Brain Injury uh, Association of Wy Alliance of Washington. Um, and they have a great um, website that you can, and it actually has resources on there, but also a, a call-in line that you can call to talk with a resource provider who can link to some of the local resources um, or, or as Maria said, potentially vir sometimes virtual resources that might be useful. And absolutely, I think that transition for youth and particularly around the invisibility of the injury and going back to school and, and trying to recover. And especially we've talked to lots of kids with sports related injuries um, and the difficulty with, you know, potentially not being able to play that sport, the thing that they're very passionate about. And so also, you know, the potential for lots of, um, you know, mental health sequela after the TBI is, is a real problem. And I think that um, we do have some resources in the state, and I think by the Brain Injury Alliance would be the place to start would be my recommendation. And hopefully the Bright City that Maria is, you know, talking and has been talking about and is involved in, you know, hopefully that's something for in the future, you know, for, for people who are coming out of uh, the hospital after a, a more moderate to severe TBI, that'll be something that, you know, we hope will be will become more widely available for people. That's, that's one of the goals of, of that study ultimately is to disseminate it widely not just in Washington state, but across the country. So we're excited about it. And, you know, I think it's, we wish it wasn't, you know, we wish it was available more widely now, but I think, um, you know, we're excited about the, the prospects of it. Sure. Well, and I think in um, this person's question, there was a little bit more context that I didn't read aloud, but one of the things they mentioned was that difficulty locating mental health professionals who have knowledge and expertise in TBI. And uh, Dr. Moore, I believe in your chart, mental health was sort of at the bottom end in terms of access for a lot of people with TBI. Do we know why that is or why maybe mental health in particular has, is, less, is a lot more limited than maybe other types of rehabilitation in terms of availability? Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, there's a lot of reasons um, that we probably don't have time to, to go into here related to policy and kind of some historical things that have happened in our um, kind of in our social, in our structures, our healthcare structures. But but yes, I would say that that is unfortunately absolutely true. And that's not just in Washington State. Our data is from Washington State. But as you saw in that, in that table, I mean, mental health, the availability of mental health services is extremely limited, for, especially for children who, who have you know, Medicaid insurance or certainly who, if they're uninsured, um, that would be you know, even more limited. Um, but most, most kids can, can at least be hopefully signed up for Medicaid. But the, but the services, they're just, not, they're just not that many available. And I think even fewer specialists who, mental health providers who can specialize in understanding traumatic brain injury. It's just, it's not something that, um, that is widely available, unfortunately. So I think some of the things Maria, you know, and that's partly why we, you know, we're engaged in doing some of these webinars and, and thinking about trainings and, and making things available for people online across the public health provider, you know, kind of spectrum so that we can have better trained providers who are able to do some of this more specialized work with people with TBI. Um, and applying some of the evidence-based practices that Maria talked about um, that have been used in other fields to uh, working with pe persons with TBI. Mm -hmm. Just a really quick follow-up with, with that. I, I think that's um, all accurate, Dr. Moore, and really important as well as we're thinking about future focus. Um, and working there at the uh, Institute for Rehab, we see medical students as well coming through. And the structure of education that they're receiving in medical school is starting to change. I know that's not very helpful right now, but many years out from now, you will have professionals who do have to um, know more about rehab and know more about TBI. And it is starting to shift a lot of 
um, medical schools are looking at more holistic practices. They're talking more about these things. It's becoming more integrated as it has been very siloed in the past. And ideally, as we go forward, that will continue to be the case. Um, so there's a, a little hope there. <laughs> Great, yeah, and, and thank you for that uh, question um, uh, from the audience. That was, uh, I think, a, a, an important thing to draw out that in the presentations here. Um, okay, so we have another question here is, are there geographic disparities in TBI outcomes? In other words, do some states have less disparities than others? So maybe are there some states that are, are doing, um, maybe are, have found some ways to help decrease these disparities? Yes, there absolutely are. Um, so over at the, uh, the ACL's uh, TBI awareness talk, we had uh, folks nationally uh, who came in and talked about what their states were doing. And I was, I was floored at some of the remarkable things that were happening in uh, Minnesota and Colorado. Um, their, their state's policies are very intentional about the way that they are designed with uh, folks who understand TBI, folks who um, have been impacted by TBI, researchers um, as well, who actually help the state write for certain waivers so that they could do things like having more funding available regardless of uh, income level for patients and families. They did things like making sure uh, transitional facilities were available for folks who came out of uh, acute rehab. Um, they did things like also making sure that uh, there were more opportunities through a program called vocational rehab, which every state has, but they made sure that there was a TBI specialist who was there in, in their, each of their county's offices who could, if a person had experience, TBI would be routed to this person so that when they wanted to go back to school or go back to work, they would have someone who really understood TBI helping them with that process. Um, so I think that states that have been that intentional around it really do have better outcomes because uh, their policies are structured in that way. Um, Geographically, for instance, in Texas, uh, we actually rank at the absolute bottom for folks living with disabilities. So that's not TBI specific, but just folks living with disabilities. As far as the number of accessible restaurants we have, um, being able to get funding, um, having access to certain parts of the healthcare system, there are a lot of real tangible struggles in Texas, so yes, you can see that across different different states, for sure. Great, um, and I can also see uh, someone posted here in the Q&A, um, a link to some resources at Seattle Children's Hospital that might help with mental health referral. I've made a note of that, and I'll include that also when we um, send out our, our kind of wrap-up email with the evaluation information, so we can share that information as well. Perfect, thank you, that's great. Great. Um, so, uh, so another question that I wanted to have is, um, and particularly thinking this has sort of been a public health series, and I know we have a number of public health um, professionals in our audience. So what are some ways that public health um, can help support health equity research and practice? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's kind of one of the, you know, objectives of this discussion and kind of the talk is what Marie and I I think we're hoping for is for people to, it, obviously all of you are already thinking about this. Um, and so to continue to think about in your practice, whether that's at the micro level, the meso or the macro level, the policy level, which is critically important as Maria just, um, you know, discussed where, you know, where, where you whatever layer you're working at, how can you incorporate some of the knowledge that we have about where the disparities are, exist and what might be some of the solutions to addressing those. And I think that, you know, really depends on what level of practice you're, you're working in. And I think, you know, we're hopeful that, um, and we hope the, the conversation continues beyond this, you know, this discussion, because it's nice, it sort of feels a little one way. So I'd, I'd love to interact with people more, um, you know, more dynamically as well to really talk about 
what some of the things I know that some of you are already doing and then some of the things you're thinking about doing and how either HIPRC here at the center can support that work um, or, or collaborate if that's of interest to people. Um, and, and also, you know, consult if, if needed to on a specific project you're thinking about or a community that you're thinking about working with. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I can answer that for everybody, but I think that would be my hope is that people are beginning to really expand what they're already doing or think about new ways to try to address disparities that they know exist in their work, in their, you know, kind of world that they're working in. Yes, I would just echo that. I think that that is, um, absolutely of chief priority um, in my opinion. Uh, one of the things that we learned in uh, MPH school, we talk about, you know, prevention is cure. So the more that we're able to do preventively, the, the better off people will be in the end. And I think that that's very, very obvious, but there's also uh, thinking about policy and how that how we can impact that more um, concretely and more consistently, uh, it saves money if you're able to avoid the issue versus having to deal with it. Um, so if we're able to fund proactively more education campaigns or um, more community resources or, um, you know, kind of where I am situated here more in the tertiary, more um, just reducing rehospitalization after the event has occurred. But I think as public health professionals, we don't, I think we get a little inundated once the, the, there's a, a problem, whatever it may be, whether it's a specific disability that we're talking about. Um, and we don't think as much sometimes about how, ways that we can prevent it. So I loved seeing all of these questions about um, prevention. The only other thing that I would add is that um, one of my favorite quotes that I also got picked up while I was at MPH school uh, is it, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. So thinking about that and thinking about intentional design and thinking about prevention, and as Dr. Moore mentioned, it doesn't have to be a national policy that you're trying to impact, but wherever you are, um, there are rules and regulations that define what you do. So the more engaged you are in that process, I think the better off uh, people in your area are. So if it's you know just a standalone company or standalone hospital, if there's more that could be done on the prevention side, for instance, there was a researcher in our office last year who started a fall prevention campaign and um, was able to get administrators eventually involved and funded. And then it was something that we passed off to one of our community centers. And now that fall intervention or that fall prevention program runs um, quarterly at our community center. So I, I think that there are really way, many ways to be innovative and to think about how, uh, what your specific role may be or how you can be more engaged in those uh, policy activities that really define what those outcomes will be for the future. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you to both of our speakers. Um, I think we are, we are uh, close to our end on time and uh, we've answered the questions in our Q&A tool. So um, if we can move on to the next slide, just a couple quick announcements um, as we get ready. So there will be a recording of today's webinar and it will be available with closed captioning in a few weeks. Um, so we will send an email to everyone who's registered for the webinar when that is available. Um, you'll also be getting a course evaluation from us in the next couple of days. We appreciate your feedback. We do read them. We do use them to improve our webinar offerings. So that uh, is very valuable to us and we look forward to hearing from you. We can go to our next slide. Great, and just uh, one more reminder that we do have our discussion board, uh, TBI Topics for Health Professionals, a place to continue the conversation, continue that resource sharing, um, uh, more discussion, about, um, about this, is this issue and many other issues related to TBI and different things that people are doing. Um, so we hope that you'll join us there. Uh, we also do post webinar recordings there, discussion questions, uh, resources, and our Ask the Expert Q&A events. And if we go to our next slide. 
And uh, we already have a couple of discussion questions up to think about, which is are in what ways is your organization working to promote health equity in TBI or elsewhere? Um, or if you personally are things that you know of that are going on to promote health equity, we'd love to hear about it and hear about success stories that are out there. Um, and our second question is, how are communities impacted by health disparities in TBI currently part of addressing those disparities? And how could they be more fully um, incorporated and included, um, like, at several, like our speakers were talking about earlier? Um, so again, we hope you will join us uh, on the discussion board and continue that conversation. Thank you so much to our speaker, speakers, Megan Moore and Maria Cole, um, and for your valuable conversation. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. And I'll add that please feel free to um, contact me as well if you have other you know, questions or um, potential you know, thoughts on projects. We have a myself and Dr. Beth Abel direct the outreach core here at the Injury Center and we're happy to talk with, with any of you who are working on things or have ideas um, or want to talk with us more about some of the things we're working on here. Great, and you can definitely contact us and also can reach uh, Dr. Moore through HIPRC and that contact information will be in the emails that you get as well. All right, thank you very much. We're gonna wrap up today's webinar. So thank you again for joining us and uh, we'll hopefully see you on the discussion board.